as you know, NLP breaks down the the way people process sensorily, yeah. and talks about how eyes move in a certain direction when you're accessing something visually or you're thinking in images, and your eyes move in another way when you're thinking auditorily and thinking in words, and then your eyes move in a different direction when you're um, in touch with your feelings, and often there is a breathing pattern that goes along with it as well. Uh, high up in the chest, kind of fast like a bird almost, is uh, extreme visualizing. And then a kind of more even rhythmic tempo is, is more auditory, uh, an auditory type of breathing or rate <coughs> of breathing. And then deep belly breathing is more kinesthetic. And sometimes with these, with these things, it helps to just uh, practice a little exercise where you move your eyes down and to the right or wherever you locate feelings, hold your eyes there and breathe deeply for a while. And, it, and then imitate the posture you were just describing. You know, bring your shoulders up as you do it. And uh, from that standpoint, from that posture, just, just practice that as an exercise. Sometimes that's kind of a nice little integrative meditation slash meditation. Yeah? Has anybody else? I just I shifted my eyes down and to the right. Mm -hmm. And I got a very happy feeling and shivered from mm -hmm. it. Like, Yeah. We mm -hmm. talked about using a trigger, and yeah. it's like, uh -huh. that was very powerful, more uh -huh. so than my hand, my mm -hmm. eyes, that movement really yeah. gives you a jolt. It may be an area that you're not used to going into mm -hmm. also, you know, and usually one of the things people get from that initial study of NLP is what they're good at, though, because they'll, they'll tend to specialize in certain senses and not others. And then what they're um, what they've habitually overlooked, or just you know has hasn't been as important to them. For instance, in the thing you described yesterday, um, if you've been a, in a three-ish mode, if you were a four but you've been in a three-ish mode for a long time, you might have a habit of actually staying out of your feelings when you're in that. Um, threes, when they get into a kind of efficient drive and are concentrated on activity and doing things in the world will tend to stay in kind of visual and auditory modes and stay out of their feelings, you know, because you, you, your feelings are too confusing or irrelevant to accomplishing tasks. You know, you're, a challenge doesn't care about the feelings that you have about it. And so, you know, you, put, you, you kind of brush those aside and you might be physically involved, but not, um, not kinesthetically involved, not emotionally involved in the same way. And so, so I get happy because I love feeling. Yeah. Whereas a three, Whereas a three has a tendency to, to conf confuse them sometimes and is not as inclined towards, that, that's a, a big area of challenge for a three. That's an area of, of real growth to get, to get in touch with their feelings. And if a th so as far as feelings go, their, their approach is as powerful as a four's. It's just directed in a, it's like the energy level around feelings is as powerful. It's just in a different way. Maybe it's avoidance or not being comfortable. Yeah, if I'm a, it's like if I'm a. Or being comfortable or wanting to look at That's it. right. Uh huh. And being drawn to it almost. Being, being sort of attracted, you know, in a way. And within the three style, um, a person might, their, their, their greatest defense might have been in growing up to organize their experience so that their feelings were kind of locked out. And within the four style, their greatest uh, uh, defense and even refuge might have been to go into their feelings and to go, to go deeply in them, almost too far and wallow in them, you know. And so there's some sort of balance between those poles to be found. But if you discover in, in an NLP workshop that you've been visual and auditory for a long time and maybe kinesthetic in an athletic sense or in a physical sense, but not kinesthetic in an emotional sense, then that winds up being a realm of your experience, a world of experience for you to explore. And if you have the, um, sometimes when fours have difficulty, the, the, the problem is that they've been wallowing in their feelings for a long time. They need to kind of come up out of it and find the world and do something constructive, do something useful or make a contribution instead of complaining, you know. But, um, if you've been organized in the opposite way through life circumstance and the way you've lived your life, then 
you know, an integration of action and feeling would actually really be quite powerful and satisfying for you, I would imagine. You know, that would be a kind of a good direction to go in to bring those two together in a way that... Uh, Tom, does that sound like the conflict that you were working on? Yeah, I think so. I thought we were just thinking about that. Yeah, that would describe... I mean, that would be the kind of conflict. The, I mean, you're getting a sense of the Enneagram's potency in terms of this, because, you know, you can kind of put your finger right on something. But, um, yeah, Sue? When, like, I'm a nine, and when I, I tend to roll my eyes up with part of the... Usually that's visual. Uh, looking up is visual, usually. In most people... Looking up and to the left is uh, visual memory, and looking up and to the right is visual constructed, seeing things that you haven't seen before. Now, these can be reversed, but usually about eight out of ten people have, would have that. Um, let me demonstrate for the camera. Oh, uh, we got the camera, don't we? Okay, uh, so up and to the right. Now, that's up and to the person's right. And, and I'm a right-handed person, so th that seems to matter as well. Sometimes left-handed people, they'll go up and to the left for constructed images, seeing things you haven't seen before. But if you ask me what the house um, that I lived in as a child, what it looked like, and that was a direct memory, I'd go up and to the left and try and find it. If you asked me about the house I hope to be living in when I'm 80 years old, I'd go up and to the right and see it there and imagine it, cre create an image. Would it be reversed if you were left and It, it, mi it might well be. Right. Yeah, it might well be. It, it's, well, it's, it, it's not because of that. It's not symbolic. It's something neurological. You know, it's something to do with hard wiring. But, um, yeah, it, it often is reversed if you're left-handed. And about one in ten people, I think, are left-handed. And it, you, out of those, about 90% are, are, have reverse wiring this way. But I'm left-handed, and, and I, I operate the way that you do. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm traditional, in it, but I am left-handed. Yeah, well, it, it can go. The main thing is that there's a pattern, and it's generally the visualizing is generally up uh, or out in front of a person sometimes. And so if you're working with someone or you want to get to know your own pattern, then you just, uh, that's what you try and figure out. So, th so that's for visualizing. Then auditory accessing usually has to do with uh, what they call shifty eyes, you know, in polite company. Uh, looking to the right or looking directly to the left. Level and to the right, level to the left. And so when you talk to yourself, or actually, if I was to remember a uh, conversation, remember something that my wife said last week, I might look level and to the left, and that's where that would somehow stimulate memory un unconsciously. I'd just look over there. If I was groping for a word to say, you know, like you have a, a word on the tip of your tongue and you can't quite find it, it's not really on the tip of your tongue, it's, love, it's over here, it's level and to the right. In other words, constructed, con constructed words, if you're trying to if you were to, if you were writing music, for instance, you might listen over there. Yeah. And then for a lot of people, um, down into the left is internal dialogue, where you go inside and you have a talk, you talk your day over with yourself. You say, well, you know, it's almost like you're several people, maybe. You know, it's like, well, geez, what did you think of that encounter with the boss? You know, well, I don't know. You know, or you have to kind of ruminate about something where you're having, where you kind of. Uh, just having internal dialogue, and then down into the right will be feelings. What? Feelings, in most people. So if you ask me, you know, well, you know, how how do you feel about that? I might, well, pretty good, you know, and that's where I'd be looking. <laughs>